In this Edge of Creations, we'll be covering Lecture 3, Atomic Theory 3, from Unit 1. Electron Orbitals An orbital is a graphic representation of the space an electron is most likely to occupy. Instead of being located in precise locations at a given moment, the idea of an electron orbital gives us the most probable path in which the electron would move. Niels Bohr created a model with circular orbitals that surrounded the nucleus. These were later proved incorrect. Based on the quantum mechanical model, we now know that each energy level in electrons is divided to various sublevels. Using the formula 2n squared, we can determine how many electrons can fit in a single electron shell, where n equals the electron level. These sublevels are classified as S, P, D, and F, based on their location in the periodic table. The letters are paired with numbers 1 through 7 based on the element's period on the table. Each element begins with 1s to the first power. The exponent shows how many electrons are present in the element, so hydrogen would begin with 1s1 because it's in the first period and it contains only one electron. Proceed by increasing the exponent until the orbital fills up. So s is at maximum of 2, p is a maximum of 6, d has a maximum of 10, and f is a maximum of 14. <clears throat> Depending on the element's position on the table, you may have to find, you may have to bring a lower level's orbital to the front, meaning instead of going from 4s to 4p, I would have to first bring out the 3d orbitals because it takes less energy to fill those up than the 4p. When a p, d, or f orbital is one under half full, the s orbital will give one electron to that orbital to make it more stable with half the orbital full. So if I have 4s2, 3d4, the 3d orbital is very unstable because it's almost half full, and half full is more stable than anything else besides full. So my 4s is going to give to my 3d, I'm going to have 4s1, which is half full, and 3d5, which is also half full. Electron configuration. <clears throat> the orbital diagram provides a visual aid for seeing how sublevels are organized. Below I have 1s2 in a little box, and I have both my arrows there, which each stands for an electron. Then I have my 2s2. I made a dash in the middle to show that they were different sublevels. Again, those are two full boxes. Then I'm moving on to my 2p sublevel. I have one, two electrons in my first box, one in my second, and one in my third. This is a diagram for oxygen because there are a total of eight electrons. You can also find that by counting up the exponents. So I have 1s2, 2s2, so 2 plus 2 is 4, and then 4 plus 4 from the 2 plus 4 is 8. <clears throat> Notice how the electrons in the p sublevel are spaced out. Electrons will try to occupy open boxes if not all are filled. So if I have an apartment complex and I have three open rooms and four people, do you think the two people are going to try to get with each other You know, in both cases? No. I'm going to have, you know, to force one into a room with another, but then I'll be able to give the other two people their room by themselves. Because there are four electrons fit into three boxes, only one box will contain two electrons, as one apartment will contain two people. Electron configuration. When an atom's orbital diagram is left with unpaired electrons, you know, boxes that are not full, it is known as paramagnetic. The open space causes a want to gain or lose electrons to fill or empty the boxes. Conversely, an atom is diamagnetic when all electrons are paired. This atom is stable and does not want to gain or lose electrons. Shielding is when many inwards electrons block moments of attraction from other outer electrons, which contributes to an uneven bond and can result in the outer electrons being easier to lose. The term isoelectronic is used when two ions have the same amount of electrons. So, if I have oxygen, which has eight electrons, and I have neon plus two, it wouldn't you know, be common to find because neon's a noble gas and would retain all of its electrons more naturally. But if I were to, plus two means I would have two less electrons. So I would have eight electrons in that neon atom and eight electrons in my stable oxygen atom, therefore isoelectronic. The first example, draw an electron diagram with labels for each level for the element selenium. Then tell if it's paramagnetic or diamagnetic. So selenium is number 34 on the periodic table. So I'm going to draw a stable selenium ion, which is going to have 34 electrons. So I'll draw my first box. 
and then one two. That's my one s two orbital. Two s two. I'm going to continue drawing the boxes until I have the proper mount, and you'll see the final thing set up. Here's the completed diagram. I added my other boxes, and I have down here my 3D10, which comes before my 4P4, because, as previously mentioned, it requires less energy to fill that up than it does the 4P level. So, in my 4P4 level, which is my final level, I see that I have a complete box and then two singular electron pairs. They're not paired up, so this tells me paramagnetic because these two here are singular electrons and are not paired up with anything. Periodic trends. Periodic trends are traits determined by an atom's position on the table. Atomic radius, the measurement of an atom's size, increases as one moves down and to the left. This increases electron levels and decreases attraction. Ionic radius involves an atom's charge and size. With electrons outnumbering protons and anions, the attractive nuclear forces aren't strong enough to keep the electrons tightly orbiting and increase the size. Cations are smaller because the protons, protons outnumber the electrons and greatly attract them. So here I have two examples. In my calcium 2 plus and my regular calcium, this calcium 2 plus has less electrons, meaning that um, my protons are able to kind of keep track of the electrons more. So if I were to have teachers as protons and students as electrons, and I had five teachers and two students in the room, <coughs> the students would be very limited, and, you know, the teacher would keep watch over them. If I had 100 students and one teacher, the students would, you know, be able to be more rambunctious because there would only be one teacher monitoring them. It's the same concept that with my, when I have less electrons than I do protons, the protons can keep track of them more like in their grasp, which is, you know, a tighter radius. And then conversely, with more electrons, um, the protons can't keep track of them all that well, so it expands. Same with the iodine here. I have my iodine negative, which means there's an extra electron, which means it's a little bigger. First ionization energy, which is the amount of energy required to remove the first outer electron, and electronegativity, which is the ability to gain electrons to form bonds, both increase up and to the right. Because the innermost electrons are very attracted to the nucleus, it would be very hard to remove them. As electrons orbit further away, they're more likely to be lost and can be easily removed. As we mentioned shielding beforehand, you know, if I have 17 different electrons, you know, just orbiting around the center before I get to a certain electron in the outer ring, then it's going to be easier to take that away because it's going to have moments where it's weakening the bond. Electronegative elements attract electrons more in chemical bonds. Fluorine is the most electronegative element because the noble gases are included. Because the atomic radii of the upper right elements are so small, their ability to attract electrons is greater. So if I have you know, fluorine and chlorine in a container, it's most likely that the fluorine is going to take in more because it's, it wants to gain electrons more. In the second example, list the following elements in order from largest to smallest atomic radius. Bismuth, manganese, nitrogen, and uranium. Then give the most electronegative of those elements. So on a periodic table, I know that bismuth is very far below others. Manganese is one of the top row transition metals. Nitrogen is a non-metal in the second row. And uranium is one of the very bottom elements. So I know that uranium, in comparison to the others, is going to be the very biggest because it's the furthest down. So uranium, I'm going to say, will go first. Next, bismuth is probably is the second closest to the bottom because manganese is again the top row of transition metals. 
So I'll put the bismuth. Next up is manganese. And then finally, nitrogen with the smallest because it only has seven electrons in its stable form. The most electronegative element of the, not in general, would be nitrogen as well. Why? Because it's the furthest top and to the right. And in relation to fluorine, it's very close, so it must be at least relatively electronegative. And you would know, based on the trend, that it is more than the others.